This talk is it's going to start off about this thing, uh, a little data type called a lock-free transaction, and it's going to move on to uh, what to do with those, uh, which really boils down to a sort of monadic process. But uh, we'll get there. So we're going to begin with a little bit of hand-waving, and then we're going to build uh, our data type using nothing but an axe and a, and a means of making fire. <laughs> so um, I, I just want to uh, make a couple of points uh, about why we care about concurrent processing. And I mean this distinct from distributed processing. It's all within the JVM. And the usual reason we hear all the time is that it's all about the cores. We've got to give them work to do. But no, not really. Um, we've been doing uh, concurrent processing long before the multi-cores came along. And I've spent most of my career doing it on uniprocessors. The reason we do it is because uh, our software is living in an environment that's asynchronous. Oh, uh, that um, shocking piece of Vero board there is a, a bunch of opto isolators and a microcontroller at my place gathering events. Uh, to represent a, you know, an asynchronous environment. <laughs> so as I said, uh, we'll develop this just you know, from the rawest sort of um, uh, dwarf-like ingredients. Um, uh, but what we're going to come up with is something very minimal, but it's also very general, more general than, say, Scala Z Streams, which has you know, got a tighter focus. Uh, uh, more comparable to ACA actors, perhaps. Um, but we, unlike that, we want it to be functional and well-typed. So um, this is uh, just a totally random snapshot of uh, things that you might use for concurrent processing as of, you know, September 2014. There have probably been hundreds and hundreds of libraries and frameworks over the years. I mean, ARC is the survivor of God knows how many actor systems. Um, so um, uh, I, I can't resist having a little bit of a free kick here. Um, it's what I normally do in these talks. Um, I'm starting to get known for this, I think. Uh, but some, some smart person tweeted this. You know, they, they, their point is that um, how come TypeSafe's uh, Premiere framework is all built around writing functions that take any? So, and it refers to the re refers to the refers to the fact that ACA actors, the messages are of type any. But um, someone else, uh, an author of this book, um, tweeted um, that. Uh, the unit's also a problem in this signature. And I think it's uh, much uh, underappreciated how nasty that unit is. It may, uh, from a functional programmer's point of view, it means you can't compose actors in the way you would expect. But um, it also means that you're forced to write imperative code in a receive method, at least in the first instance. You have to build, you have to build up a bit before you can start writing functionally. So look. Um, I, I wrote a blog post about that if you, if you really, uh, if this rant isn't enough. <laughs> but look, in fairness, it's a difficult problem because in the concurrent world, we're inherently dealing with asynchronously evolving state variables. In other words, mutable state. It's inherent. Essentially, a real-time program contains at least as many asynchronously evolving state variables as the environment it interacts with. Um, and if there's synchronization between these evolving state variables, that's an effect. So I want to do functional programming because I, you know, I love working with the mutable types and, and functions. It's so easy to reason about. But this is what I've got to deal with here, mutable state and effects. So, well, um, 
Simon Peyton Jones said in some video I watched um, that we should combine effectful computations and effect free without letting them pollute each other. So I think, you know, this is the clue. It's sort of like, what would Chuck Norris do? What would SPJ do? <laughs> um, so this is my take on it. I'm sure a million people have said this before. I want to manage, manage effects and state, but I want to do that using a structure I built from pure functions. Uh, you know, we obviously want to keep it simple. Now, one thing that will make this little presentation a bit different to, let's say, Scala Z future is that I like to keep all of the pieces separate, synchronization, separate concern to uh, process definition, separate concern to uh, execution of a defined process. But it's not a big point. Okay, so uh, now we get down. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't joking about the uh, about the axe and the means of making fire. This is what we'll use: an atomic reference and an executor service. And we'll just start from there and we'll build everything from scratch. Um, the competing approach is the blocking world, where we start from uh, the familiar uh, Java. Uh, uh, synchronized wait, notify, and thread type. So we're going to use the ones on the left. There's an interesting discussion about um, Java memory model efficiency and so on. I'm not going to go into it now. Um, maybe that will get discussed over beers. So the essence of lock-free design is compare and set. And uh, here I've wrapped a compare and set up into a little, uh, a little method here, just so that we can uh, get an idea. Is there a pointer? No, okay. Um, I can do an umbrella. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so, um, Look, uh, what happens with compare and set is uh, uh, we've, we've got an atomic reference that is a cell that contains a value. And uh, it's going to be one of these evolving state variables I've been talking about. I like this umbrella, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad. Um, <laughs> Um, so uh, uh, what's happening here is that we, we pass our function that just uh, you know, transforms a T and uh, we get the value out of the cell, we transform it here and then we put it back in such a way that we detect if anyone else has intervened in the meantime, that's compare and set. And so let's say some other thread came along and intervened, uh, well, we'd re-execute the attempt. And eventually, you know, barring a really pathological uh, contention situation, we'd succeed in applying F to T and putting it back in the cell. So, OK, it's pretty elementary stuff, are right? Going, are you going to handle starvation later? Or? Not really, not really. Um, it's all very low level stuff here. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's really that's what lock free is all about, doing that. Um, and that's a way of writing it in Scala. Um, so uh, just to give you an idea, um, here's a function uh, that uh, uh, if, if I call ff with a t, it gives me a transformation function. Um, and I've made it, you know, it's going to be a monoid uh, plus this, this could be, um, this could be summing bird or it could be Scala Z, whatever. Um, uh, I've, th I've got a lot of code along these lines. Um, and uh, here two threads are repeatedly calling the transact function from the previous slide, applying uh, this uh, 
applying a transformation. In each case, the transformation is um, going to be adding this, this T value. Anyway, the idea is that at the, uh, these threads uh, contend with each other. Um, at the very end, somehow we know it's the end and we can call transact with the identity function and get the sum out. Remembering transact is this thing here, right? It returns whatever the result was. Okay, well, we, we, this is starting to sort of slowly build to something. But there's no suspension of execution here. What happens in normal blocking programming, uh, we call wait on a, on a monitor. And uh, at that point, every, the world stops for that thread. The thread is suspended. The way I like to think about it is the thread is suspended in the thread object. So its call stack is in the thread object. And later on, some other thread can call notify and the rest of the comp computation will, the thread will resume. So this semicolon is, uh, just think of it as a flat map, right? It's, uh, if, you, if there's a few functional programmers who don't uh, understand semicolons, it's flat map really. It's sequencing everything before the semicolon with everything after it. <laughs> um, but we usually see it, you know, you call blocking Q take and this uh, computation is suspended in the thread object. All right, enough. But we can also suspend execution in thunks, right? Just in functions. Um, so that's starting to get a bit complicated, you can see here. So uh, here's my transact function again. But this time, my um, type that, I, you know, that I'm going to be, uh, that I'm going to have in my atomic reference is either a queue of suspensions or a queue of values. And the objective here is that the, this take function is uh, going to uh, call this continuation, callback if you like, um, when it has a V. So uh, in, in the case where there's already a bunch of waiters, well, we just add the suspension onto the, onto the queue of waiters. Otherwise, we, uh, we you know, take the tail of the, um, of, the, uh, of the queue of values that are waiting to be given to us, and uh, uh, that becomes the new state. And here, uh, out, outside of the function, we, we've got the original uh, queue. We take its head and we give it to K. So I don't know, is that like as clear as mud? <laughs> um, there's two things going on. This function is what's being applied atomically to the atomic reference. And it's a function that either puts K onto a list, onto a queue, or it strips the head off the alternative queue of values, right? This function is happening outside of the, uh, uh, of the atomic uh, reference. It's just looking at what was the value. If it was a Q, uh, a Q of V, OK, we'll, we take the head and give it to K. So either your, so either your, your suspension ends up suspended on this queue, or it gets run, one or the other. Carry on. Yeah. Or is it really? It's a spin loop. It's a spin loop. Because you remember, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of like a spin loop, because uh, you remember transact, it's got a loop in it here. It keeps attempting to compare and set until it gets a clean shot. Only under heavy contention, right? So you'd have to have heavy contention for that to happen. And most of the time that 
doesn't happen that you get content, heavy contention on a single cell. So you have... Um, it, it'd be really difficult to imagine. I mean, uh, don't forget, this loop is, is not... It's, th no one's holding any locks here, right? This, you only expect this loop... The, the loop would only go round again if there was an absolute coincidence, another thread at exactly the same, um, uh, you know, nanosecond decided to up, do the same operation. And then it's, it's more like collision on an Ethernet, right? Yes. Because there is, no matter how... Eric, pass the mic. Let's turn it on, just mute, press the mute. Even with... Um, Should work. Even with... Uh, All right, okay. Here you go. Here we are. Oh. Ah, okay. <laughs> even with contention and even with preemption, um, because of the compare and set, because that can only fail if something has successfully managed to invoke the function, the update function, and then invoke compare and set without the underlying value changing, which at least one thread will successfully manage to do, then that's, that that's thread will make progress, irrespective of contention, preemption, anything else. And so, yeah, that's... At least one thread will make progress. And anyway, yeah. There's also uh, like certain kind of optimizations you'd maybe make in a production version of this. So you consider this the algorithm, and you know that's important. Yep, sure. Um, so uh, we're okay here, where we were, where what we were doing inside the transact loop was we were just adding two values together using whatever uh, whatever definition of plus we have. Uh, now, uh, over here, well, now the thing I'm holding a reference to is either a, one of two kinds of queue, a waiting queue or a queue of ready values. So I don't want to kind of labour it. I mean, who likes these presentations where, you know, you go through the minutiae of code? Oh, this one's going to be all about that. Uh, okay, so we've leveraged that little transact thing to, uh, to update a state that, is, that includes suspensions as well or alternatively weighting values. Um, now, OK, the, the, this code's bloody complicated already, you know? I mean, we've we barely got started and, and it's already starting to mount up. So um, one thing I've noticed is that uh, Scala Software Transactional Memory's got a nice little model for this. Uh, this is uh, their transaction, in other words, the part that will be done uh, atomically. Um, and they've got this little directive here, retry. So if you're um, trying to uh, uh, perform some operation atomically and you decide that it's not ready, for example, let's say, uh, in the in this previous case, there was no uh, there was no an empty queue of values, so we're not ready to run our uh, to run our um, our k function. Um, in in STM, they just call retry, and what that does is it just abandons the transaction, and it and it requeues it, and sometime later, their system will run that transaction again. Presumably, they're very smart about it. I mean, they, they probably know uh, which variables, which uh, uh, transactional variables have been changed, and they have an idea when they ought to retry. Um, the trouble with STM, by the way, is that all of the, all of the data you update atomically is in these ref cells. And you manipulate those as variables. So it doesn't pass muster as a functional programming paradigm. So let's take, well, I want to take an inspiration from it anyway. Um, and I want to sort of take SPJ's comment totally literally. And here is a transaction abstraction. 
So I want to say that my transaction consists of a transition function that now, now instead of being from T to T, it's from T to option T. So my transaction may fail if this returns none. Um, and also coupled in here is an effect that's going to be run when the transaction finally succeeds. The T value passed to the effect is the pre, is the same as the T value that was passed to the, to the tra transition. So it's sort of like um, I've taken that SPJ thought a little bit too literally here. You know, OK, let's separate the pure functions from the effects. Um, and I've, you know, I've managed to get it about an eighth of an inch away. Um, so here's, the, uh, here's how it works in, in points, as I said. Um, we pass, one, we, we construct a transaction by providing these functions. We pass it to the transactor, which is our cell that contains a T, and that state is updated if the transaction succeeds. Otherwise, the transaction is retried later. Different to the compare set loop. We'll be smart about when we retry. Here's a dumb implementation, and I'm not going to uh, bore you with the little, uh, you're sort of trying to trace through code here, but um, essentially, uh, when we run a transaction, we, you know, we're running it against an atomic reference that contains um, a, a T value and uh, a, a list of transactions that are waiting to be retried. And what happens is um, if the transition succeeds, we put back the transform value and we strip out all of the transactions that need retrying. And uh, then what we do is uh, run, run all of the uh, transactions again, the ones that were waiting for retry, RS. Uh, oh, sorry, I've got my logic around the wrong way here. Sorry. Assuming we do, the transaction succeeds, assuming uh, we do manage, not manage to update the state because of contention, we, we loop. Otherwise, sorry, this is it. We run our effect and then we rerun all of the transactions that we're waiting for retry. So that's a, a simplified version of um, uh, of this uh, transaction run loop. Um, the, the difference between that and uh, one that you would actually use, one that I've posted on GitHub, is that we don't want to blindly retry every transaction all the time. We can be smarter about which transactions we retry. Essentially, um, uh, and I'm not sure that I even made this uh, tail recursive um, yeah, so, so look at the one on GitHub instead. <laughs> this is uh, sort of uh, explanatory. Um, okay, so um, this retrying of transactions uh, is all about, uh, it, it, it's, it's not part of the, of the contention mechanism, it's not part of the atomic locking, it's simply a way of in a generic way, handling suspended code. Um, so we've decided we have to suspend, okay, we return none, and we're suspended and will be automatically run again at some point in the future when T0 will be different and maybe we'll succeed that then. So to illustrate, now, okay, um, there's probably a million ways that you could do this sort of thing. You could skip this transaction abstraction altogether and go back and just do 
uh, this stuff. But the idea here is to, um, is to simplify uh, programming of typical concurrent data structures. So uh, I'll just define a helper function that, create, that, that runs a transaction for me. It takes a partial function and a thunk here. So this is the effect and this is the pure function that we're going to run. This is going to transform the transactional value and this is the effect we're going to run later. Now let's use it. So start off, let's have a semaphore. So our transaction will be of type, our transactor will be of type long. So somewhere in there, we're, in our atomic reference, we're holding uh, a long. And the, the P or weight operation of the semaphore, familiar from school, um, is implemented in a one-liner here. So uh, we simply uh, pass our continuation in and uh, if the value is uh, positive definite, we decrement the value and that's what happens to the to the contended transactional value. But outside of that, if that succeeds, we run our continuation. And as a convenience, not part of a semaphore spec, really we're passing what the value of the semaphore was to our continuation, which could be ignored perhaps. On the other hand, signaling the semaphore, you um, offer some amount. So you, re you recall what semaphores are used for. If the, the amount in the semaphore might represent the value in the semaphore might represent the amount of a resource that's available. So here we're making resource available. We pass in a value, it's going to be transactionally added and that will always succeed because unlike here, there's no condition. This partial function always succeeds. It adds something to the value in the semaphore and well, we have a continuation here uh, just because we've got a pro forma method signature in fact, this would always succeed, so we don't pa perhaps need the continuation value to be passed in explicitly. So that's semaphore. And we can keep going multiplying these examples. Here's a channel. So it was a one-liner, but the slide made me spread it out a bit. Um, the channel, the transactional value is a queue of some type. And uh, the take simply chops the head off the queue and then in the effect section, it gives the head to our continuation. The offer method uh, simply uh, adds our, takes our value and adds it onto the end of the queue. But there's considered to be space. There's considered to be space in the queue. So there's a comparison to backlog. If it succeeds or when it finally succeeds, it will call the continuation. So that's a, if you like, a queue with back pressure. Notice we've still got lots of effects going on here. Um, you know, our ultimate goal is to get away from effects. Um, at this stage, we're just sort of building up to that. Um, now, there's a whole library of um, concurrent data structures in the, in, the, uh, in the Java standard library. But they're almost all of the blocking type. It's assumed the suspension will be in a thread object. So we can go right ahead and we can just go through and rewrite all of them using our new tool. You can see how simple a synchronized variable is. Um, we allow the variable to be set or unset. So it's similar to Scala concurrent sync var. Um, Except that, again, our suspension is in the form of a thunk, not a thread. Um, we can have a cyclic barrier. Um, very, uh, underrated, very useful uh, concurrent type. Essentially what happens is any number of uh, processes come along and uh, come to the take method and pass their continuation in when some other process comes along and offers 
or just signals this, passes unit, you see, um, all of those processes are released. So it's a barrier against which all the processes bump up against. How am I going for time here? Okay. Oh, yeah, I better speed up. Okay, we can keep multiplying these, a latch, a Y or a rendezvous. This one's taking a, uh, this one's taking uh, either, uh, sorry, you offer either one or a T1 or a T2, uh, and you take tuples T1 and T2. And it's, its job, the, of course, the offers are all happening asynchronously from different threads. Its job is to pair them up um, and hand them out. So second part of this talk, process abstraction. So we have um, our uh, series of things like channels, uh, barriers, latches, whatever. Um, and we can make even more exotic things using our transaction. You can see how each one of them is, you know, virtually each method is down to a one-liner. Um, now, what are we going to do with them? We have to have processes that are taking and offering values. And ultimately, we're going to do that without sort of explicitly uh, running effects. So I've got three options for you here. The first one is to use Java Concurrent Future, which is, sorry, Scala Z Concurrent Future. Um, this is a, a, a something of a Swiss army knife of a concurrent data type because it, uh, uh, it's capable of uh, specifying a, a computation that is to be run asynchronously, a computation that is to be run when a uh, continuation is invoked, uh, or just a computation that is to be trampolined, that is, you know, to be run without consuming the stack. And um, so to show you how we could use this as our process data type, um, imagine channel of string is, is that channel I was showing earlier. It's got a take and an offer. Um, and I, my... Uh, fairly brain-dead example, is going to take the first n lines of a, of a, a stream of strings and uh, send them from the input channel to the output channel. And after that, it will consume and discard. And so async is a method on Scala Z future. Um, I simply pass, this is the take method of, of my channel, previously illustrated. Um, and it's, you know, implicitly converted to a function here. Um, you know, uh, uh, I don't have the signature up here for you to see, but essentially that creates a future which will, uh, uh, when it's run, it will uh, invoke the take method and will complete when the... Uh, input channel has a value. And so we then compose that future with this future. Uh, if n equals 0, we compose it with headlines of 0. In other words, 0, we're going to uh, uh, give a credit 0. We're going to... Uh, uh, give create a future that is based on the output channel offer method, and and when that uh, when that future is uh, run, um, and then then the uh, the offer succeeds because the output queue has room in it. Um, uh, it, this this whole structure will will result in a unit in our process. So n thing to note here is that n is a uh, even though it's a val, it's a it's a it's a evolving state in our process. So n thing to note here is that n is a 
uh, even though it's a val, it's a, it's a, it's a evolving state variable within our program. So we're getting close here. I mean, there's no direct uh, usage of uh, variables or effects anymore. Um, and the thing to know about Scala Z Future is that um, it's uh, completely passive. It's exactly like the processes uh, Alex is talking about. When you create a future, it's not running. It's not like Scala Future. It has to be run before. This, this whole thing reduces to a, a future that is a specification of a computation which you subsequently run. Okay, I've stolen all of Jed's thunder now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yes, this is a future of nothing. It never terminates. Um, as long as more values appear in the input channel, this will keep processing them and it will either write them to the output or discard them. Okay, option two, and I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time, but um, I really recommend uh, Runa's uh, uh, talk that he gave at Scala Days, uh, which had this title. Um, and he shows how to bend the free monad to your will. Um, his free monad is slightly different to the one in Scala Z, but it's an educational talk. Um, uh, so we can use Runar's technique to build ourselves a monad other than Scala Z Future. Uh, we can build a monad that will be our process. And he gives detailed instructions about how to do that sort of thing and reasons why you might want to use free uh, I'm going to skip over the details. Have a look at his presentation. It's very good. <clears throat> okay, here's my favourite method. Um, I just uh, went out the back and knocked up my own from scratch. You know, you could probably be shot for doing this in some circles, but I don't care. Um, so my uh, process is going to be just like Scala Z Future in a, in a way. I've, you know, this is called now in Scala Z Future. The two most important states of the process monad are a constant process that will always return this value or uh, a sequence, one process following another. And this, this one is the result of doing a flat map. But you also want to be able to uh, trampoline a computation. I'll skip over the details again, but one way of doing this is to put a state into your monad, as I have here, that represents a, uh, sus uh, you know, a suspended computation that you're going to be trampolining. In other words, you <laughs> trampolining means running a recursive computation without chewing up the stack. Uh, now, here's some of the reason why I just want to make my own one uh, today. You know, uh, I want to do my own idiosyncratic error handling. So I introduce a failed state into my process. Um, and that allows me uh, to do a sort of ARCA style error processing where the error, errors are held out of band. They're not part of the data streams I'm processing. Instead, a whole assembly of these processes will be killed in the event that any one of them generates an error. Um, uh, I'd also like, at the same time, to uh, you know, attach names to processes. Um, you know, you can have a lot of fun. You can have as many of these states as you like. Here are the working ones for an, a concurrent process. We need a waiting state, and this corresponds to exactly to a certain state that you'll see in Scala Z Future. It's simply holding this sort of continuation structure here. And when, this, uh, when a process waiting is run, it invokes this and waits 
for the uh, for the you know this would probably be from a channel or a or a barrier or something, and it waits for it to to respond. Uh, you also want the ability to dispatch uh, processing steps to the fork join pool or the executor where they'll be run on a pool of threads. And one thing that's not really addressed in Scala Z uh, future that I think is kind of nice is to have the concept of a parallel process, subtly different to an asynchronous process. This guy is a process that we're going to spawn and forget about. It, it will communicate via channels and we can turn that into um, uh, parallel processing, uh, uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate. Um, but the reason it needs to be a state of our process monad is because from within the process monad, we're only dealing with a specification. We're not dealing with the actual implementation. Um, so the way that you might spawn a process or run a process is not going to be embedded here. Instead, um, you know, and this is my taste here, um, I want the execution, execution to be a completely separate concern. So we'll have a, a trait that um, can be filled in to run a process and uh, cover uh, what sort of thread pool execution we're going to use if that's called for and what to do with failed processes and also what to do with spawned processes that succeed but their results were never collected. So I probably should have said right up, up, the, front, up at the front that the type parameter of a process is its ultimate result type. And when that type parameter is nothing, uh, it means that we're dealing with a process that will run forever. Um, or when it's uh, uh, a value, um, it means that it might produce that value. And we can collect it. OK. So here's an example of a little piece of code using this um, using this uh, process abstraction. Um, it's a little bit contrived. I mean, the, the idea is to demonstrate uh, a send op sorry, a receive operation, and that's a symbol for flat map, receive operation. So that produces the process that will result in a, in a value from this input queue. Sequence that with this function here which might produce a process that sends flat mapped back to the beginning, sequenced back to the beginning, or it might fail, or it might complete, or it might continue with a different state. I'll, I'll have to speed up a little bit here. OK, now, things get more interesting uh, uh, as you start working with process types. And uh, this would work probably with any of the process types, whether it's Scala Z Future or this process one that I've got. Um, we're interested in parameterizing processes. So typically, let, let's imagine that we characterize input to a process as itself as a process. In other words, an input is something that when it's run, may produce a value of type A. An output is something that you call with a value of type A and it may eventually complete with no further information unit. Um, so characterizing input and output this way, uh, we might define a process that is parameterized by an input, of, uh, you know, a source of rows a sync or an output of sums, and it runs forever. And we might have another one that is parameterized by uh, a sync of rows, and this one also runs forever. Um, so 
what we're going to want to do is lift our uh, offer and take methods we saw in the previous half of the talk into processes of those signatures. And a little bit of code that I won't show here, but essentially is a series of simple uh, type classes um, uh, creates uh, wiring operators um, and uh, what you can see here is, okay, I've got a, a channel um, of row for my input, I've got a channel of sum for my output um, and this is saying uh, run that generated rows is from the previous slide, that's, that's that one there. It requires um, uh, a rows channel to be lifted into a process uh, and the wiring operator does that. And this operator is the parallel operation operator. So two processes are composed together to run independently of one another. And this uh, wiring expression here is connecting the rows channel to fold rows and connecting its output to the channel called sums. Uh, and this is the run method of site. Uh, in other words, when we finally, this whole expression here has type, is of type process because each of, each of these combinators reduce the higher order functions down, eventually down to type process and this AND operator combines processes to form proce parallel processes. And so at the end of the day, this whole thing resolves to a process, a specification of what to do and the, the only sort of side effect visible to us as programmers at the end of the day is we have to call run. So that's it. Um, we sort of started from nothing. The, the volume of co code in, involved is, is, is very tiny. It's, you know, you, you've seen a fair sampling of it just on these slides. But we ended up with a type safe and a functional paradigm for uh, writing concurrent programs. Um, yeah, that's the that's where you can look at the look at the code such as it is. It's all very alpha. I, I suggest you. Uh, I mean, I use it, but uh, I suggest you know with something as simple as this, uh, if you really did want to use it, fork it, you know, play with it, turn it into your own. Throw away my process, build your own. The end. <laughs> Questions, anybody? Or do you want to wait for later? Yes? Or right, it's me again. Yeah. So I missed that bit that we used the cast to create a blocking. How we I mean, that slide, I think, the, the, the first slide you had after the cast operation. I don't have any cast operations. Cast, cast, compare and set. Oh, compare and set. Oh, okay. Right back to the very the beginning. beginning. Yes. <laughs> because it all built up on top of that. Yes. But I missed that bit. I mean, uh, the slides are online if you want to yes. sort of pour over okay. it. And, and I'm happy to, to do that with you. But. Uh, uh, you know, where I can bring up the, uh, so I, I guess it's a tricky little piece of code. That one there. This is where we're using, keep going, this one. Okay. Yeah, maybe it's the way I've written this makes it a little bit, it's a little bit stylistically written perhaps. Um, but you remember the transact method takes two functions. The first function is a pure function and the second function is a side effect. Well, sorry, it takes a single, f I'm getting ahead of myself. 
it takes a single function, which is a pure function, and it returns the transactional value as it was bef before that transformation took place. Um, the, the way that the state of this thing would evolve, that's the type T up there at the top, the way that would evolve over time is that initially both queues would just be empty queues. Someone would, th this is only one of the two methods needed, this is the take method, we'd have an offer method as well, not shown. Um, so uh, to, we have empty queues and then along comes a, pro a process or a thread calling take. Well, there are no values. It wants a value, see? K wants a value. K is our callback, if you like. Wants a value. Uh, there are no values. The queues are empty. So we do this branch here where we... The, yeah, that one there where we, where we add K onto an empty queue of suspended functions. And then we, no, we're finished, OK? Everything's static again. Now a thread is going to do something else. It may call take, and we'll get another K on the queue. Or it may call offer. And offer is not shown, but it will provide a V, a value. Uh, and uh, what we'll do in offer is we'll, we'll take one of the Ks off the queue and run it. So two things have to happen. Within, within a transactional context, I mean, this is before we've gotten up to my transact, transaction abstraction, but within an atomic execution context, we're transforming values of type T, and then outside of that context, we're running side effects. Yeah, so think of it as a queue of values on one side and a queue of things to do with values that haven't arrived yet on the other side. Yeah, you've either got one of those queues or the other because it's an either. Um, so you've either got a whole lot of waiters or you've got a whole lot of values. Uh, yep, another question. Am I, um, am I right in inferring this is kind of non-compositional, that like if I have something that works on two separate transactional variables that I can't um, do some atomic operation over both of those variables at the same time? You're absolutely right. Um, there's no uh, two-phase commit, uh, transaction cancel, uh, whatever. Um, the, w the, the substitute for that is found uh, by building, let me run forward a little bit. Okay, these structures here that can be built with single transactions can generally speaking, you can, you can build what you want out of these. Um, but yeah, you're basically right. There's, nothing, there's no two-phase transaction, two-phase commit. There's no transaction cancel from the outside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this how closure atoms basically work? I have no idea, I'm sorry. OK. <laughs> uh, so closure ones use a kind of um, the same sort of idea of compare and set kind of variables. So each one's in, um, uh, sort of individual. Um, I'm not sure about their transaction. Yeah, but it's. Uh, yeah, so there's refs and there's atoms, right? Um, yeah. Uh, oh. I think the atoms work together within a transaction. The refs are just effectively just a com uh, an atomic reference underneath. Yeah. So I hope it's not like, um, not like this. I mean, what, what, what we want to do is um, get away from code that is updating. Ex ex we don't want the the code that we write after we finish our library, the library uses. We don't want them updating uh, variables uh, explicitly. We work very hard, first of all, to... So the, this is Scala STM, and 
that some condition at the very first line is a kind of a cell. You, you can assign to it and you can read it. And you can do that within the atomic bracket there to make it transactional. And it's great, but it's not functional. And uh, yeah, so, um, so we work very hard, first of all, to come up with just a continuation passing style uh, so, sort of set of uh, uh, structures based on, on this, and then to lift those into uh, one or another type of monad so that finally all of the uh, sort of effectful code is washed out of it and the only effect you ever see is run at the end of the world. Um, do you have anything for resources management, like when you compose processes, making sure that uh, if you open files, they, they will be closed in case of an error? No, no, not at all, Eric. Um, it's, uh, it's at a lower level than Scala Z stream, which I'm sure you're alluding to there. And I mean, if you have a stream processing sort of a job, you know, I would use Scala Z stream or something. But this is, this is more general than Scala Z stream. This is for uh, more open-ended concurrent processing or concurrent programming. The sort of job you would have used actors for, except you couldn't bring yourself to. <laughs> no. OK. All right. There's nothing earth shattering on it, but I, it, the Java memory model explains uh, uh, how memory affects how the caches L1 through, uh, in practice, how L1 through L3 will be synchronized for you between cores is what it boils down to in the, in the end. Um, and it's very significant because, um, you know, you, you, you see all this uh, code, you're seeing these loops I'm writing and you're thinking, Jesus Christ, you know, this thing's going to run like a dog because look at all those instructions we're executing. Well, get real, the, um, the uh, price, each core is executing probably, it's retiring two, four instructions per cycle. And here's how many cycles cache hits cost. So the real cost in concurrent processing is when threads synchronize. And it's nothing to do with the code path, you know, like any loops or anything you go through or any variables, any objects you instantiate. It's all to do with what you force the hardware to do with the caches. And you can see we're talking orders of magnitude more work, even at, even at L1, it's an order of magnitude more than an instruction. Um, and by the time you get down to the uh, bigger caches, you know, that's, that's what's making your concurrent program going, go slow, I think. And it gets worse on the latest Intels. So, like, you can do even more, the, um, you know, and the caches are bigger, but they're... Um, Slower. <laughs> Slower relative to instruction retirement. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we've got lots of instructions, everybody. We've got lots of, we can retire them like nothing. But what we haven't got is memory and cache bandwidth. So the design needs to be frugal about um, causing threads to intersect with one another. Because if they're on different cores, that's a disaster. Yep. Cool. Okay. All right.